Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. Uh, but we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com and hit the contact us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. Just after the end of World War II in 1945, the United Nations was founded. And I'd like to read you the, their purpose statement, if you will. I took it right directly from their website. Quote, the United Nations was created in 1945 following the devastation of the Second World War with one central mission, the maintenance of international peace and security. The UN accomplishes this by working to prevent conflict, helping parties in conflict make peace, deploying peacemakers, peacekeepers, excuse me, and creating the conditions to allow peace to hold and flourish. These activities often overlap and should reinforce one another to be effective, end quote. To which I would say, how's that working out? Since the Second World War and the founding of the United Nations, there have been a long list of wars. Let me give you a sample. This is not an exhaustive list, but simply a sampling of the wars that have taken place since World War II. Less than a decade after the end of World War II, the Korean War took place. Then we had the Vietnam War that lasted almost 20 years, which began in uh, late 50s, early 60s. Then we had the Six-Day War, I believe it was in 1967, fought between the Arabs and Israel. Then there was the, the Afghan War between Russia and Afghanistan, lasted 14 years. Then came the Persian Gulf War. And as the new millennium dawned, we had war in Afghanistan between the United States, the coalition forces, and the Taliban. And that war lasted officially for 14 years. See, the world's pursuit of peace has proven to be an elusive goal. The history of our world, sadly, is a history of war. The history of mankind is filled with bloodshed, destruction, and massive losses, loss of life. In the 20th century alone, it is estimated that between 100 and 150 million people died in war. And what do we have today? Even today, war continues to rage on between Russia and Ukraine. Thousands of lives have already been lost and billions of dollars have already been spent simply because one country has to defend itself against another country who wants to annex them. War is an expression of human sinfulness. But there's also another aspect of war. War is a judgment of God. And the purpose of war is to arrest the attention of the unbelieving world. It, it's, try, it's God's effort to try and get them to pause and consider what's going on. It's God's effort trying to get them to consider their ways and to give them again the opportunity to repent of their sins, to repent of their idolatry. By the way, all sinners are idolaters. And gives them an opportunity to turn to Christ and to worship the one who deserves to be worshipped, and that, of course, is God, their creator. Now, not only in war, we see this revealed in other areas, but in war, we see the depth of human depravity. And war is the inevitable result of rejecting God and his law. 
So as the first five seals were opened and the first five trumpets were sounded, sinners still had the opportunity to repent and come to Christ. But we saw as the sixth seal was opened and the sixth trumpet judgment sounded, the window of God's grace is preparing to close. Mankind's opportunity for salvation is beginning to slip away. As Dennis Johnson wrote, the sixth trumpet, trumpet, which is the second woe, is humanity's last warning blast. And as the sixth trumpet is sounded, we note that there is an increase in the intensity of the judgment. As I said earlier, this judgment intensifies in the form of war. And it's a devastating war in which one-third of mankind is killed. Now, we hear the number one-third, and we kind of gloss over that and say, well, two-thirds are still left. Well, let me put it to you in real-time numbers. It is estimated in 2023 that the population of planet Earth will reach 8 billion people. 8 billion one third of 8 billion is 2.666 billion people. If these demons were released today, 2.6 million people would lose their lives. 2.6 billion, not million, billion people. This planet has never seen anything that begins to compare with that. And what we see here in this passage is the absolute insanity of sin. Despite this worldwide war, mankind digs in their heels and refuses to repent of their sin and their idolatry. So when the sixth angel blew his trumpet, John said that he heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar. Now, you can go back to when the, the tabernacle was constructed and the, the articles in the tabernacle were constructed, and you will see that one of the items for the altar in the tabernacle were the four horns of the altar. And these four horns symbolize the strength of God. So from a position of strength, from a position of authority, a voice comes and this voice instructs this angel to release the four angels who, uh, who have been bound at the great river Euphrates. Now this river plays a prominent role in scripture. It plays a prominent part in biblical history. For starters, it was the boundary of the promised land. Later in history, it was the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire. And during Israel's existence as a nation, what do we find? We find that their enemies, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians, would come from the east. And they would lay siege to the nation of Israel. And what happened eventually? Eventually, they were carried away into captivity on the, the far side of the Euphrates River. But keeping in mind that John uses symbolism here, we need to ask ourselves, what did the meaning of the Euphrates River mean to the first century Christians? That's what we need to understand. Well, one commentator helps us out. He says, the name marks the boundary between good and evil, between the kingdom of God and that of Satan. Likewise, Grant Osborne says the Euphrates was a symbol of foreign invasion since so many of the Old Testament invaders crossed it to attack Israel. So we could summarize by saying this, any news that came from that part of the world, from the Euphrates River, was seldom good news. And likewise, what John is about to reveal here certainly is not good news for mankind. Look at verse 14 saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. 
God has kept these four angels imprisoned. He has kept them locked away until the exact time arrived for them to be loosed. And just as Luther said that the devil was God's devil, so too these demonic angels are God's demonic angels. And look at verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Notice that these specific angels had been prepared for a specific time to accomplish a specific purpose. What are we seeing here? We are seeing again, as we've seen repeatedly in the book, that God is in control of history. Nothing happens apart from the eternal decree of God. Nothing happens apart from the permission of God. Now, we need to remind ourselves that what happens here is a continuation of God's response, his answer to the prayers of his people who cried out from under the altar, how long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood and judge those who are on the earth? This is God's ongoing response to their prayer. And by the way, even as they prayed, God knew the exact time down to the exact hour when these four angels would be released. So what do we see here? We see that God has a detailed plan. History may seem to be utter chaos, but it is not. We, we with our limited knowledge, our limited wisdom, we may not be able to make sense of it, but to God it makes perfect sense because God is using the events of this world to bring about his eternal plans and purposes. And as these souls under the altar demonstrate, humanity is characterized by bloodshed. And they are about to experience bloodshed on a scale that they could never have imagined. And back to God's detailed plan. Think about this. Remember Jesus told us to work while it is still day. Why? Because the night is coming when we cannot work. We are still in the day. That means that we still have the opportunity to work, to serve, to witness, to evangelize, to disciple, to warn others to flee the wrath to come. There ought to be a sense of urgency about us as Christians. We need to take what we read in Scripture seriously. We don't know how close we are to the end. We have no idea. Nevertheless, we should act with urgency. We don't know what tomorrow brings, do we? We have no idea. So keep that in mind. Now, if we use our, our sanctified imaginations, one can just imagine these four angels straining at their chains, straining at their bonds, for only God knows how long, desiring to break their chains, to be released from their bonds, and so that they could go and inflict humanity with their vileness. They just could not wait to be set free so that they could then attack all those who have not been sealed by God, yet are still made in the image of God. They could not wait to be released in order to go on a rampage. Let me say it this way. They can't wait to live out, to act out according to their nature. They're vile. They're wicked. They are of their father, the devil. They know nothing but death and destruction and deception. 
and they're ready to wreak havoc on mankind when they get the chance. Again, I will remind you that we see that God is in control of history, and I remind us of that because it brings comfort to us. We are not living in a world of utter chaos. We are living in a world that is under the control of God, and what seems like chaos to us is working out perfectly according to God's plan. So the Euphrates River symbolized invasion from the east, and this invasion is described in verse 16. Look at verse 16. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. Then John says, I heard their number. Now, some translations put this number at 200 million. If, if that's correct, and I see no reason why it couldn't be 200 million, think about that. That is a huge army. It's a devastating force. And John says, I heard their number. I don't think that John means that he heard the hoofbeats of 200 million horses charging forth. Rather, I think that he actually heard someone speak the number to emphasize just how large this army is. He heard the number 10,000 times 10,000. And then John goes on to describe what he sees in verse 17. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them, they wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. Again, John is using symbolic language here to describe the utter grotesque nature of these creatures. He's trying to convey the hideous nature of this army. And notice that he describes these horses as having heads like lions. What do we know about lions? Lions are dominant predators. They are commonly referred to as what? The king of the jungle. But it wasn't the teeth, it wasn't the fangs of the lion that inflicted all the damage on mankind, was it? John says that there was fire and smoke and sulfur that came out of their mouths. Have you ever been around Ben and Matt and myself years ago? We went up to Wisconsin uh, I preached at a church up there, and they had some kind of a hobo cookout or something. What was that thing called, Ben? Hillbilly, Hillbilly cookout. Sorry. And, uh, and it, was, it was in Wisconsin, and we stayed at this, this fellow's house. And man, oh man, uh, we didn't realize, you know, we're just, we're just city slickers. We didn't know what was going on. But the water stunk. I mean, it stunk. I mean, it's like, I, I can't take a shower in this. I'll smell worse when I get out than when I got in. You know what it was? It had sulfur in it. it. had sulfur in it. The best way that I can explain it was, it was like about 10,000 rotten eggs, and you're bathing in it. Hallelujah. <laughs> but this is what John sees here. It's fire and smoke and sulfur that comes out of the mouths of these creatures. In the picture here is one continuous stream coming from their mouths like a, some kind of demonic flamethrower. And this demonic army is being controlled by these four angels who had been prepared for just this task. What an absolutely terrifying time this will be. But there's another hideous facet to this being. John says in verse 19 that the power of their horses is in their mouths and in their tails. And then John describes their tails as serpents with heads. Now think about this. If you were able to somehow escape the fire and the smoke and the sulfur, you still had to escape the tail of the horse that looked like a serpent. And it's there to inflict a deadly wound as well. And one of the things that's going to be so terrifying about this event is no one's going to see it coming. You know, repeatedly throughout the history of our world, we have seen empires, nations, who seem to be invincible, but they found out that they weren't. Think about Attila the Hun and the Gauls conquered the Roman Empire when the Roman Empire thought they were invincible. You know, Islam conquered North Africa and nobody saw that coming. And likewise, no one, not even the United Nations, will see this event coming, this war coming. 
And they will be just as powerless then as they are now to stop the slaughter. I've got millions here, but it's actually billions. And unbelievably, despite the carnage, despite the inconceivable death toll inflicted by this demonic army, mankind still refuses to repent. Grant Osborne says, most shocking is the fact that after the demons have produced the greatest death toll in all of history, the unbelievers still reject God and prefer to keep worshiping the very demons who have just tortured and killed them. And then he says, is there any greater proof of the insanity of sin? No, that's it right there. And look at verses 20 and 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands. Think about this. Again, we don't know when this happens, but when it happens, we already have the technology that information transfer is instantaneous. The world will watch this go on. This isn't 1776 where news traveled by horseback. The world will watch this go on. Did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold. Why is that worshiping demons in there? Because behind every idol is what? A false god. It's it's a demon. Worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. What do we have here is a, is a massive worldwide deception. They are totally deceived. And they are so deceived that despite God's repeated warnings, they still refuse to give up those things that brought judgment against them. And we read this and we say, oh, how, how foolish can they be? But don't we see this even today? The doctor tells the smoker, you've got lung cancer. You've got to give up smoking. How many of them don't? Just can't give it up. And I wonder what uh, the United Nations and all the diplomats will say during this time of utter devastation. Now make no mistake, beloved. These things are happening to unbelievers. Let me put it more pointedly. These things are happening to guilty lawbreakers. They are not innocent bystanders. They have broken the law of God, and they have taken pleasure in doing so. They love their sins so much that not even the most severe judgments will cause them to give them up. Again, if you find it hard to believe that mankind refuses to repent despite all the pain and the suffering, just think of the drug addict or the alcoholic. They know the pain that they're causing those who love them. And they're probably even aware that their activities, their actions hold the potential to destroy themselves. Yet the addiction is so strong, they can't give it up. That's what John is describing here. Their addiction to sin is so strong, despite knowing that it will eventually destroy them, they refuse to repent. As one commentator said, they use those same words, refuse to repent, emphasizing their complete and willful rejection of God. Do you know what's going on here? By the way, what I'm talking for the next 30 seconds, turn to Romans chapter 1. God is letting mankind go their own way. I got to be honest with you. I talked with John about this yesterday. I struggled with this passage. Death on such an unimaginable scale. And 
And I found myself wanting to be an apologist for God. Trying to somehow rationalize all of this. But John brought some clarity to the conversation, helping me to see they're getting what they want. They're getting exactly what they want. Look at Romans chapter 1. We'll start reading verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, <clears throat> excuse me, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So first thing to note here is all mankind has the truth, but they suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Why? Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, how did they get that way? That's the way they wanted to go. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Boy, if that, doesn't describe, if that doesn't describe our culture. In exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up. See that? God gave them up. In the lust of their own hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their own bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature more rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Here again, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable patience, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, here we go again, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. See, the very sins that they desired and longed for has, as Richard Phillips says, become God's judgment on them. And then I, I just, I want to emphasize this here. The fault, the reason for this judgment is because of mankind's rebellion against their creator. Did you catch that last part of Paul's statement there? Though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but gave approval to those who practice them. In other words, it's not being done in ignorance. They're, they are not sinning out of ignorance of God's righteous decree. No, they are sinning despite a knowledge of God's righteous decree. They know God's standard, but they care nothing about it. And mankind is simply doing what comes naturally to them because of their sinful nature. And beloved, do you know why the only reason why we haven't yet had a war in which one third of mankind has been killed? You want, you want to know the only reason why that hasn't happened? Because of God's restraining grace. That's the only reason. So what should we take away from a passage like this? Let me give you three things. First, number one, in this passage, in the entirety of chapter 9, now let me expand it just a little bit, God reveals the destructive nature of sin. I mean, look at what chapter 9 teaches us about sin. Sin causes pain, despair, deception, more pain, more deception, more destruction, 
and ultimately what? Death. Yet mankind, knowing the results, they continue to sin. And God warns mankind of the dangers of sin, of the consequences of sin. Therefore, no one will be without excuse. No one can ever say, God, I never knew just how devastating sin and its effects can be. No one can ever say, God, I had no idea of the consequences of sin. Say, why not? God has made it plain and clear in the scriptures. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sins shall what? Die. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Now, just those two verses alone, they, they contain really deep theological truth, but they're so simple, even the, the, even the youngest child can understand that. They, can't, they, they, they have no excuse. And just, just reading those two statements ought to give every person pause, knowing that the soul that sins shall die and that the wages of sin is death. So you would think... A rational person would stop and say, well, wait a minute, I better check this out. I don't think I'm heading down the right path. But no, such is the insanity of sin that they're not rational when it comes to their sin. Oh, they try and rationalize their sin, but they're not rational about their sin. Second, God shows us what life is like for those who reject him. For those who reject Jesus Christ, for those who reject the gospel. Sadly and tragically, we live in a culture that has rejected God. Of course, of course, the politician loves to say, God bless America. But don't be fooled. They want God to bless America without paying any attention to God, without any desire to obey God, without any desire to honor God, and certainly no desire to submit to God. They want God's blessing without any of the strings attached. It's almost like they think that we deserve God's blessing. On what basis, pray tell, does America deserve God's blessing? No, we deserve exactly what we're getting, God's judgment. We've done everything but spit in his face. You want to know why we're in the state that we're in today? Go back and read the first few chapters of Genesis, and you will see that our culture attacks everything that God spells out in the opening chapters of Genesis. Everything. Everything. And then we have the gall to stand in front of a microphone and say, God bless America. God is so merciful because if I was God, he'd probably be zapped on the top of his head when he said that. We live in a culture that routinely and we see this more and more exhibits an anti-Christian bias. How many TV shows or characters and movies have you seen who is a Christian, who, who is portrayed as a Christian, but ends up being some degenerate, some maniac? I was watching a show from New Zealand the other night, and they said, oh, he's a fundamentalist nutter. Rain Wilson, I think that was the name of guy of Dwight, Dwight Schrute. I saw where he just came out, and I, uh, from what I know of Rain Wilson, he's not exactly a conservative fellow, nor is he a Christian. But he was decrying the anti-Christian bias that he sees coming out of Hollywood. Now think about this. This is an unsaved man. And I guess there was just recently some mini-series or something called The Last of Us. And he said, he said from the opening of this series, when they introduced the Christian, he said, I knew he was going to be the bad guy. And I guess in the last episode, he was revealed as the nut. And we're going to see this more and more and more. 
Our country has chosen a path that will ultimately lead to its destruction. Countries and world powers who thought they were invincible have found themselves humbled by the mighty hand of God. Where are the great powers of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Rome? How about England? England ruled the seas, colonized a large part of the globe. And England is at best a bit player on the world stage. What about America? Do we think that we're any match for God? No, one day America will be a footnote in history. And what characterizes all these nations? It's the same thing that we see here in Revelation 9. Idolatry, the worship of false gods, everything that John describes here in Revelation 9. The rejection of God, the rejection of Christ, the rejection of the gospel. Third, God has revealed to us the only path to peace. I saw a church sign the other day that said, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Isn't peace a function of love? Listen, all mankind experiences common grace. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. But we need to be careful there. You know, we need to be careful here. Words have impact. And so I'm driving up 25, and I see the sign. God loves sinners, but he hates the sin. Well, I'm thinking, well, how bad could it be? If, if, he, if, you know, if he loves me, he, if, if you love someone, you're not going to do anything bad to them, right? See, we, ha we have to be precise with our language. Words have impact. And even if this world never finds peace, never experiences peace, which it won't, by the way, we don't have to despair because God has made it possible for us as individuals to experience the peace the world continually chases but always slips through their fingers. The only way to experience peace is through Christ. Remember how the Old Testament prophet described the coming Messiah for unto us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the verse ends there. No, no, no. Prince of Peace. Isn't that a wonderful, isn't that a wonderful title? Prince of Peace? Prince of Peace? It's a royal peace. It's a heavenly peace. It's an out-of-this-world peace. What did the angel say when he announced the birth of Christ? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth what? Peace. Um, now, you know, uh, we, we, everybody loves to quote this during Christmas time, right? But they fail to take note of what the verse actually says. Glory to God in the highest and on earth to all mankind. Is that what it says? Is that in some newfangled translation? Is that the Christmas edition? No. It says, glory to God in the highest and on, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So we need to ask ourselves, with whom is God pleased? Well, first of all, he's pleased with his son. Therefore, he is pleased with all those who are in his son. He's not pleased with sinful mankind. There is no peace for the wicked, saith the Lord. So therefore, you can't know the peace of God if you're outside of Christ. Paul wrote, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote in Colossians, And through him, through Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. See, there's only one way to achieve peace. The world thinks it's foolishness. They want to mock it. They want to laugh at it. They want to reject it. They want to imprison those who have the message of peace. But there's only one way to peace. God is very clear. Peace only comes through Christ. And let's be honest. Revelation chapter 9 and other chapters is some seriously bad news for unbelievers. You know, I'm too far into the book to, to stop now. But it has dawned on me that I can see why many, many pastors don't want to preach it. It's tough. A war unlike anything this world has ever known will one day one day take place, and when it does, the illusion of peace will be shattered forever. Every treaty, every peace agreement, peace accord will be forever broken and totally useless. There's only one way to truly experience peace, and that is through surrender. We have to lay down our weapons, as it were, and surrender the totality of our being to the Prince of Peace. And then when we do that, look at what Jesus promises us, the Prince of Peace. Notice what he promises us in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace, the Prince of Peace, the Royal Peace, the otherworldly peace, the peace that no one else can steal, the peace that no one else possesses. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. How can you say that, Jesus, because I'm giving you my peace? I'm giving you my peace. And I don't know about you, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people said, well, you know what, that sounds too good in the midst of a war-torn world. But it is true. That's why the gospel is called what? Good news. Peace can be yours if you want it, but here's what you got to do. You got to lay down your weapons. You got to confess your life of treason, seek forgiveness, trust in Christ, and you will be given a peace that Paul describes as a peace that surpasses what? Understanding. Thank you.